Oh dear god. Despite having used this video several times, it's still pretty jarring if not interesting to watch. So clearly we all know what we are here for today, the lore and morphology of the Infector. A lot of you have asked for it, so let's dive into its creation, purpose, and changes that have afflicted this poor person. First, let's start with their actual, I guess, beginnings as this seems appropriate. And to understand their beginnings, we need to understand what the yellow liquid they seem to inject is. The yellow fluid is actually considered to be a bacterial cell, however it's going to have viral properties. Much like how bacteria can interact with other bacteria during a process known as conjugation, which is where one bacteria transfers DNA to another bacteria, this process can completely change the DNA of the other bacteria to make it much more effective at surviving in particular environments. But conjugation only works if everyone is willing to play the game. Conjugation would not work on a eukaryotic cell such as ours as it would not link up properly. So this is where the viral property comes into play. This yellow fluid is an amalgamation of bacteria that will forcibly hijack a dead cell. It will inject its genetic coding and basically that cell will become the bacterial cell. So in Dead Space Martyr, the first infector may have actually been created by accident. A scientist was working with bacteria found near the black marker where he inadvertently injected him himself with the material. He slowly began to change into an infector, but quickly made his way to the black marker as it was known to force the bacteria to go into a dormant state. Upon arriving, the transformation process did cease, however, he was shot by security, showing that the DNA of the necromorphs allowed him to have a much higher pain tolerance than what would be normal for a normal human being. Eventually, he was captured and restrained to a medical table and taken away from the influence of the marker. There, his body began to deconstruct and and reconstruct into the infector. This was all happening under a blanket, so it was largely ignored by other scientists. Eventually, though, this scientist would emerge and would start infecting others because he was now an infector himself. What I find interesting is how the bacteria works overall. From what it seems, it typically prefers dead flesh, but it can still infect living flesh. There appears to be a reason for this. Right now, your immune system is fighting thousands of different invaders, all trying to make you a host. Even breathing in the air as you watch this, your lungs are taking in mold spores that, if given a chance, could take root in your lungs, killing you and allowing the mold to flourish. Luckily, your immune system combats all these invaders and is actually even powerful enough to kill the person. But it seems that the bacteria with the viral properties has an Achilles heel, and that is going to be the human immune system. Much like my video discussing on how perhaps the brain has some self-preservation tactics when it comes to the marker signal, it appears that the body has also developed an immunity to the literal bacterial viral infection brought on by the yellow liquid. But then how would it immediately infect living hosts? I have a theory on this as well. If we take Franco, we can see that he was stabbed through the chest first. This stab would cause him to immediately begin hemorrhaging out, which means that your innate immune system would not be able to be activated, and it really wouldn't even have time to be activated. Just a quick rundown, you have kind of like two immune systems, the innate and the adaptive. Innate is going to fight the first signs of cuts, illness, any Thing it can. Any bacteria or virus that shows up, the innate is the first one on the scene and the first one to begin the attack. When the innate becomes overwhelmed, it will then call to help from the adaptive immune system. The adaptive is going to take pieces of the dead organism and study it and then figure out how to actually precisely clear the infection. More often than not, this actually is going to work for most diseases. There are some that are able to get around the adaptive immune system by attacking it preemptively, but for the most part, that's how we survive. But again, for the adaptive to be activated, the innate must be activated also, or that's usually how it goes. So with blood loss, while you still may be alive, the body isn't able to respond. Also the adaptive takes a few days to come into play. So a stab to the brain almost immediately kills the host and allows the viral bacteria to begin to infect the tissue, rapidly turning them into a necromorph. But also concerning the infection of the scientist who was living, I'm going to have another theory on this. Some immune systems of people are are already compromised. If an immune system is low or weakened due to a previous disease or genetic disorder, I could see the viral bacteria getting a foothold in the body, but it would still be a very slow process as there would still be some in-house fighting, just not very effective. So with the yellow liquid summarized pretty quickly, let's move on to how this creature comes to be and what are some of the first things we are going to see if somebody becomes infected. Well, believe it or not, there's actually some major giveaways as to who is going to 
going to become the next infector. When we enter the medical labs, there is a particular point in the game where it really just seems like it's a setup for a jump scare by a slasher. The slasher will come out and attack you while you are focused on the officer puking on the ground. But if you look closer at the action the officer is performing, you will see what's actually happening. He appears to be puking up the yellow liquid or bile. As far as the game is concerned, there are no pukers located on the Ishimura. So what is this yellow liquid? It can be theorized that this is the same yellow liquid beginning to accumulate in the abdomen region, pushing him towards becoming an infector. When you come back later, the body is actually gone, meaning that something either grabbed it or he was turned. And since we do not see many other bodies puking up this yellow liquid, this is more than likely the beginning stages of this transformation. Now this transformation from beginning to end will render the human host looking completely different and almost like a completely different animal. The first time I played Dead Space, I figured that these things were created either by human design rather than necromorph design, but it's interesting because they are in fact made of one human body. First and foremost, the arms are going to be completely lost. It's possible that they have just fused with the body, but the appearance of the creature suggests that they have either atrophied into nothing or are just completely taken off. What is interesting is going to be the legs. The legs of the person have snapped and twisted to become almost the new arms of the infector. They have moved to a position almost near the top of the head concerning feet location. And speaking of feet, they have elongated and the tarsal bones presumably have lengthened to form a structure capable of grasping rather than walking. Much like our ape ancestors who use their feet for grasping, the infector is able to do the same. The chest is just the mainstay of weird. It has opened up, splitting at the sternum, with no skin covering it. In fact, if you look at it, you can actually see the exposed ribs and organs in the center, but we will get to that in a moment. The skin that used to cover the front of the torso has split down the middle and been flayed outwards. When the skin did this, it fused with the legs to create the wings. Also, it can be assumed that the wings are able to be used in this form as the latissimus dorsi of the back have also fused out as well. These wings give the creature the ability to fly while it infects humans, but mostly the legs are just used to crawl across the ground. The back of the creature is going to be mainly pretty much just smooth, undamaged skin. This is strange to see on a necromorph as usually the skin has become necrotic, but this smooth skin is going to be much like the skin of a bat, and it's going to allow the infector to flap its wings and, like I said earlier, give it the ability of flight. And now we come to the usual and most interesting portion of this creature, the head. The head looks nothing like belonging to the human race. The jaw, or what's left of it, has sunken back into the body. The face itself has dissolved away, which can be assumed at this point the skull itself has also dissolved and been repurposed. What has it been repurposed for? I'm glad you asked. Coming out of what used to be the face is a long proboscis. This snout is going to be constructed of spinal tissue, repurposed bone, muscle, and skin. Its purpose is going to be cracking open the skulls of living and dead humans and injecting the yellow liquid directly into them, causing rapid transformation into the typical slasher. The tube itself is clearly going to be the esophagus and trachea just lengthened. The esophagus and trachea are going to run down to the open chest cavity where the fluid is stored in sort of like a bladder-like sac. As a bit of side lore, did you know that the infectors actually have a predisposition to favor some targets over others? Humans already sustaining head wounds like a needle through the ocular cavity into the brain, Dr. Mercer's custom head wounds created for the infectors, and dead bodies with head wounds in general are favored over living targets as the skull is very hard and could damage the proboscis. Interesting that the creature would understand the hardness of a skull and choose to infect others, but I'll digress there. Let's talk about your interaction with them. First, the infector is going to be your first target on the battlefield. Given enough time, a lonely infector can turn every dead human in the room against you, so they should be regarded as priority one. Should one get close enough to you, regardless of the outcome, they will begin to attack you much like an overzealous prom date and try to shove their proboscis into your face. From here, one or two things could happen. First, Isaac was serious when he said no means no. Isaac will overpower the creature before letting him know that he's not some cheap date. He will visibly appear annoyed at the infector before slamming it down to the ground. He will then grab the proboscis and entirely rip it off. Much like if somebody ripped off your proboscis, it's probably just going to immediately kill and render you useless, much like it immediately kills and render the infector useless and no longer functional. The second thing that will happen during the encounter is not as great. Considering I've used up all my jokes for the first attack, we will now probably just say what happens here. The infector will get a hold of Isaac and latch on. Not able to keep his distance from the stabby portions, the trunk will pierce his helmet and skull. At this point, Isaac 
kind of just goes limp and the creature presumably injects him with the yellow liquid. But apparently we still are done. It will stab him in the neck three times before completely decapitating him and the infector almost does appear confused and will run off to chase the head of Isaac. So that about does it for the infector. Let me ask you this. What do you think about the explanation concerning the yellow liquid and really just how feasible it is? I would love to hear what you guys think down in the comments. Thank you for watching guys and you know the drill at this point. If you liked it please leave a like as that always helps the video and if you are new and you really liked it hit that sub button to get more info on stuff like this. Okay so this is a bit of a rundown so just bear with me. I wouldn't you know feel bad if you guys clicked off at this point. First I just want to say that I do read all the comments uh, but there are 71,000 people and it's become a little overwhelming as of late. I mean I really do appreciate the comments. I try to answer as much as possible but all I'm saying is just don't get your feelings hurt if I don't have like an answer for the comment. It's simply because of the volume coupled with time constraints of a full-time job and a girlfriend, it gets a little tough. Also, concerning the live streams, they are all unlisted and I'm currently trying to figure out a way to get those posted, but not like with my main YouTube videos. I don't know if there's a way to do this, but I will figure it out. Also, would you guys even want to see these live streams posted? Just let me know down in the comments. I'll post my Discord, Twitter, and Patreon link in the description. Patreon is of course the best way to support the channel and speaking of patrons, I would like to thank mine. At the scientist tier, we have Layla Elizarin, and then we got Master BC. Next up, our residents are going to be G. Anderson, Richard Muhlenberg, and Alex Parks. Our geneticists are going to be Divine Whisper, John Russo, and Scott Grant. Holding their masters in biology, we have Adam Hartswick, Andrew Lawson, Brian H. Briggs, Cameron Smith, Javier D. Rodriguez, Laffy Noskill, and the Otter Man. With their bachelors in morphological sciences, we have a Big Fat Snake, a Higao Comics, Average Soul, Dustin Ellis, Ember Safran, Eric Scott. Gillies, Immature Cape, Jacob M. Pisoni, Joseph Radical, and Natsuki Chiaki. Thank you for your patronage, guys. It really helps. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I will see y'all in the next one.